We do have one a final speaker, and this kind of came together at the end. Uh, by the way, I'd like to thank Justin Genovese, uh, who is a 2004 a Blue Jay and our senior counselor in the guidance office. In fact, I'd like to ask Justin to come up to introduce uh, our next speaker. So Justin, come on up. Thank you, Tom. I, I know this next speaker very well. I know his mother very well. Uh, she is actually a grandmother of two. Just this past week, had her first grandson. Uh, she has three boys. Uh, by now, she knows who it is. Uh, I'm a former student, but please indulge me while I speak about my mother, Karen. Please. You need to stand up, Mom. Now, before I go on and on about my own mother, I, I do want to recognize our two speakers, Luke, Patrick. I know that I'm not going to do y'all justice up here. It never ceases to amaze me as a counselor at this school, the depth of y'all's character and your heart. Um, you know, it's a very, it's a vocation that I, I enjoy getting to know all of you and getting to have experiences like this. Y'all did a bang up job, so another hand for Patrick and Luke, please. So, a little bit about myself and my family. I was born and raised in St. Bernard Parish, uh, where not many Blue Jays fly from. And my dad was a New Orleans police captain. Uh, he was on the department for, I think, roughly 33 years, ever since he was 18 out of uh, high school. He went to St. Bernard High, but he wanted my brothers and I all to go to Jesuit. As he put it, there's too many judges and doctors and lawyers that I meet on the day to day that are from Jesuit. I better send my kids there to do just that. Uh, well, I'm the only one who went to Jesuit and I certainly am not making the six figure salary that he probably had envisioned, but I know he appreciates the, the work I do and he had a special place in his heart for Jesuit. So I graduated in 2004. In 2003, when I was a junior, my dad came home one day and he showed my mom and my brothers uh, a lump that he had on his neck. It was kind of out of nowhere. And if you could picture my dad, obviously he was a New Orleans police captain, uh, 6'3", about 250, larger than life character, uh, just a you know, powerful man uh, in the community and at home. Quite the disciplinarian too, if you can imagine that. And he came home with this minor flaw. We don't really think much of it. Uh, it, it would have to, he'd have to go through cancer treatment, but as we move along with our day-to-day -day lives, we figured dad's bigger than, than anything that would come across and really just didn't think of the severity of it. Flash forward a year, uh, November of my senior year, we're getting ready for Thanksgiving drive, and my mom sits my brothers and I on the couch and tells us the news that it's getting well, it has gotten as bad as it could be. And she doesn't really need to finish at that point. Uh, she, she starts to, to cry, which is the first time we kind of saw that from a parent. And it was the first moment that we ever experienced our family unraveling. Everything was pretty rock solid uh, up until that point. A short time after that, my older brother and I are carrying this once six foot three, 250 pound police captain uh, to the car and it just feels like a bag of brittle bones. It was a surreal moment uh, with the, having a thought in my head, are we gonna break dad getting him into the car? It was just, uh, it happened way too fast and, and was not, uh, it just came out of nowhere. He passed away a couple days after being in the hospital and surprising to me, he asked to be, have his funeral mass at Jesuit, the chapel of North American Martyrs. And it, it was, I, at, the, on the, at the time, it didn't really dawn on me why, but as I look back at it now, well, perhaps that was God's way of continuing to lead me to, on my journey to eventually spend what I hope is gonna be a good portion of my life there, Father Funk, if you keep me around. <laughs> uh, but there was always just a special place in his heart for a Jesuit. He, he grew up wanting his sons to, know, to go there. He loved Father McGinn, he loved everything about it. And, had his funeral mass there. Uh, Chief Eddie Compass at the time gave one of the eulogies. <clears throat> and 
At one point of it, he looks at me and my two brothers and says, you guys, if y'all are half the man that your father was, you'll be better than most. And that always stuck with me. What could be equally true, if not more true, is if anyone told any of us, if any of you boys grow up to be half the person that your mother is, you'll be better than most. And I think about that now, I think, I think about that always, the qualities that my mother has instilled in us. You know, they always, there's the old adage of behind every, every strong man, every great man, every powerful man, there's a woman equal to that. And that was no exception at our house. And everyone who knows my mom knows it. Uh, they're, they're, there's often the superlatives that get thrown out there. You have the greatest mom in the world. Your mother's a saint. These things are all true. Some people even get angry, though. Karen, you do too much. Karen, you spoil those boys. They're going to be rotten. There may be a little truth uh, to, to that as well. Uh, but I often think about my mother in those same superlatives. I do think that there's saintliness in who she is and what she does. After our father passed, obviously things, things were, were not easy, but she saw me personally through graduation. I'm not proud of this, but I, I did my fair share of acting up at Jesuit that senior year, and Top could vouch for that if anyone wants to ask him. <laughs> Uh, so I know I gave my mom uh, her fair share of headaches during that time, but made it on stage. I was off to college uh, where I graduated from St. Edwards and would frequently call my mom, not because I felt like I had to or, or not even because I knew that she would want that, but because after our dad passed, things kind of changed. She wasn't just my mother, but she was my rock. She was my best friend. And I just know, and I know all of y'all's mothers out there, they just want to know what's going on in your life. Their number one vocation is to see the man that y'all are going to become. And they want to be there every step of the way. I was in college, and if you follow the timeline, that was from 2004, 2005. Hurricane Katrina hit St. Bernard Parish, as well as other parishes, very hard. And my mom still had my little brother. And so the two of them journeyed from, to Baton Rouge, and then to Covington, and then back, all while uh, my older brother and I were off at college. I, I just, I, I can't imagine the stress and the hardships and the dedication that it took for her to get Vinny through those times. I, I know they were difficult. Um, and I was in Austin, Texas, and a quick, quick side story, I even spent a summer studying abroad in Thailand, and I managed to call even from Thailand home once a week this time, couldn't, couldn't do it every day, and I think my mom holds the record for most boxes of jujubes shipped to Asia. <laughs> uh, Back to just the virtues that I feel my mother has, because I do think they're saintly. I don't know of another man or woman who loves so effortlessly, who makes selflessness seem so easy. It truly rattles people. It shakes people. I think that's where some of that anger comes out from, from other people. They recognize it and think, what is this woman doing? She's just running herself ragged. It's not just for her sons, even though I know she thinks about us most. Uh, it's for everyone. She has a, a job for the past 10 years, I would say. She works for the Census Bureau. And she knocks on strangers' doors and is able to warm them up and have them invite her to her home and spend an hour asking these invasive questions. And she just has a knack of, though they hate the intrusion and they hate what is happening, they all managed to love her. She just told me a remarkable story while we were in Mass a little while ago about a woman who gave her a rosary yesterday uh, after spending an hour or so with her. There's just a love there, a selflessness there that 
I admire. I recently became a parent a year ago. I have a daughter, and it's hard. <laughs> Being a parent is, is tough work. And my mom, I call her, and oh, this is happening, that's happening. And I try to relate to her, but she can't relate to me because it never felt like work to her, as she says. Said, mom, you know, when we were babies, did this, you know, did this aggravate us? She just says, I don't remember. I loved it all. <laughs> and I mean, what, what, what better way to know that you were meant to do something that you were in your, the vocation of your life when it becomes so effortless, when it radiates to others, when it's mind-boggling to some, if not all. And I'd like to close with just addressing the boys in this room. When you're going through high school, when you're going through college, like I said, talk to your mothers. Try to connect with them as much as you can. It can pay off later in the work, later down the road if they agree to uh, basically do a grandmother daycare for your children. Uh, that's, that's been a monumental uh, blessing for, for me and my wife. And as uh, actually Luke pointed out, recognize that the best qualities that are in you, not just the empathy, compassion, love, but also the strength, the dedication, the virtues that are within you, know that most come from your mother's heart and your mother's love. Thank you.